the information economy has arrived. The world is teeming with innovation as new business models reinvent every industry. Every industry. Inside Analysis is your source of information and insight about how to make the most of this exciting new era. Learn more at InsideAnalysis.com. InsideAnalysis.com. And now, here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Oh, yeah, folks. Welcome to the future. That's exactly right. Time flies and you're having fun. We're burning right through 2018. In fact, it's already May. Yeah, that's the fifth month. A third of the year is already gone. Goodness gracious. They said it was going to get faster and faster in this new world of ours, and I think they were quite accurate, quite frankly. Today's show is going to be really interesting stuff, folks. It's going to focus on one of the hottest spaces in the whole data management world. It's a space that just kind of popped up out of almost nowhere a couple years ago and is now everywhere. It's amazing how these things happen. Big data, of course, was one of the topics that just took the market by storm. Then, of course, IoT, Internet of Things, is everywhere these days. But this concept of data ops, that's data operations, basically, is really fast, taking over a really critical part of the whole data management world. And uh, there are lots of reasons for that. DevOps is something that we'll talk about just to kind of frame the context. For those who don't know, DevOps refers to development operations and really talks about when developers started working directly with operations people in businesses to get stuff done. The web played a big part of all this, of course, because so many companies are now using the web for all kinds of different things, not just customer-facing stuff, but partner-facing technology integrating supply chains and so forth. A lot of that stuff goes through the internet for obvious reasons. And DevOps really has been around for at least five to seven years in some strong force, but its origins go back a lot further than that. We're going to find out from one of our guests about that whole origin, the agile methodology, which is way back in, I think, 2000 or 2001, which uh, really was a significant turn. Uh, for those who have been in the world of development for a while, you might remember the whole concept of waterfall development. And basically what that meant was long life cycles. So 20, 30 years ago, when you wanted to roll out some major new application in your organization, especially if you're a big Fortune 2000 company, you took the waterfall approach, which required a ton of planning. You had to be very, very careful, map out what you're trying to accomplish, and it would take months, if not a year or longer, before you saw any significant value from that system. Well, the pace of international commerce these days just does not allow that kind of on-ramp these days. You have to move much faster, and DevOps kind of cropped up as a way to fill the gap and to allow companies to address business needs in virtually near time, near real time, I should say, as opposed to actual real time. That's uh, pretty cutting-edge stuff these days. And of course, some of the big major players also affected this and, and guided this development. Companies like Google, companies like Facebook and others, because of the scale of what they're doing, they simply could not use these old methodologies to get stuff done. So that's actually still playing out today. I mean, if you go into brick and mortar companies all around the country, there's still a lot of waterfall mindset out there of doing things very slowly, very uh, carefully. And of course, you don't want to be reckless in, in rolling out functionality. That's, you know, that's the death knell of any development team. But the fact is the pace has really increased these days and we're now still kind of shaking out how all that's going to get done. So data ops is like the data side of that equation. And I think a lot of companies have figured out that, you know, actually we were kind of losing uh, our ability to manage the information that goes through these applications to manage the information from an analytics perspective, but also from an operational perspective. And then, of course, this whole new development with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation coming out of the EU, which has once again thrown down the gauntlet to companies to really be much more careful about their data, about where they collect data, how they use data. Of course, here in the U.S., it's still the wild, wild west with all these cookies tracking everything that you buy, every place you go on the web. That's why if you <laughs> search for a pair of shoes, the next five days you're going to get ads for shoes on every web page you go to. That's all retargeting using cookies. That's, that's data collection. It's a bit far afield from our topic for today, but I'm trying to set some context for us all. So with that, let's bring in our first guest. We'll be hearing from three folks today. We've got Chris Berg of Data Kitchen, Mark Marinelli of Tamer, and Jira Houston of Nexla calling in. They're all companies squarely focused on this space called data ops. So with that, Chris Berg, welcome back to Inside Analysis. Oh, 
thank you for having me. Sure. So tell us a bit about um, where you got the idea for data ops, because you were in a big organization and you saw the problem up front and personal, right? And so you recognize the need and that's why you got into data ops, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've um, got some gray hair, so I, I worked in uh, companies like, like NASA and Microsoft and about uh, 13, 14 years ago, I worked for a company that did analytics for a living. And, and it occurred to me that the people who were consuming analytics and maybe they were an executive or a head of sales or a head of operations, they really had an, a, an almost river of questions that they wanted to ask. And so I worked with a team of people who were called, at the time they were called ETL engineers, now they're called data engineers. And uh, at the time we we called them predictive analytic experts, but now they're called data scientists and, and people who did nice visualization and charts and graphs. And when that business person said, hey, I've got to, I want to understand my business. You gave them something like a chart or a workbook or a PowerPoint file. And there was a whole set of activities that happened behind the scenes that this person didn't know about. Um, and there was data being put together. There were predictive models being done, charts being generated. And that process was, for me, was just was slow. Um, and it was just t- took too long. And I kept running into where that business person would say, hey, Chris, I thought this you know, I would get my data engineers and data scientists together, and, and it, we thought it would take two weeks to do, and the business person would say, wow, I thought that should take two hours to do. And that was very frustrating to me. And um, as time went on, people also want things quickly, but they also want it very, very high quality. They, they don't want to get wrong answers in their charts and graphs or, or PowerPoint files that they look at. And then finally, the amount of innovation has, has really increased, and not only in the age of big data, but just the amount of attention and all the words that people use for analytics, whether you call it AI or machine learning or predictive modeling or big data, you can't walk through an airport now and not kind of run across those terms. And so how do you actually get a group of people to deliver things quickly who actually are all that stuff behind the scenes? How do you, ha- how do you have them work quickly with high quality? And also, how do you finally get them to innovate? And that's really, to me, what the purpose of data ops is. It's really to help you know, teams of people who have different roles, uh, kind of behind the scenes, be able to answer and deliver insight to people and actually provide innovative ideas to them. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's really interesting stuff. And it's important because you need that that continuity of data management if you're going to be doing a, a responsible job, right? And especially in the analytics field, if you're analyzing data that has been truncated, for example, or has been not managed appropriately, well, you're going to make some big decisions based on the wrong information, right? And that's obviously a very significant uh, risk for organizations, right? That is, yeah. And, you know, why why is it called data ops and why is the operational side matter? Well, I think it's a sign of the industry getting mature and that there there are just, there's a hundred billion dollars every year spent on tools for people to analyze data. They take some data, put it in a database, and then they run some tools on top of it to cut it up into pieces and to visualize it in charts and graphs. And there's just a lot of great tools out there. And and the problem from a data ops perspective isn't that those tools aren't good, that there's just a lot of them. And it's not that the the data is incorrect or erroneous because data is always going to have some problems. And it's not that there's, uh, you know, too few people. In fact, there's just a lot of people who are moving and getting into the field. And so how do you deal with kind of random crappy data and lots of tools and <laughs> lots of people doing different roles so that they can they can actually provide value? I like that line. How do you deal with random crappy data? <laughs> it's, not, it's not an easy thing to do. And <laughs> I think you, you hit on a pretty important point here. And one of the trends that I'm seeing really across the entire landscape of information management is the use of APIs to connect to many different systems and synthesize what it gathers from those systems and present that view to the end user. And in lots of different wildly varying use cases, we see this. And is that kind of how you guys do it? How does Data Kitchen actually provide data ops capability to people? Well, a lot of, you know, people have data all over the place. You know, sometimes it's in an API. Sometimes it's in a set of different databases. Companies will have 10 or 20 or 30 different data sets describing what their customer does or describing what their internal operations are. And so how do you synthesize that all together? And uh, one of the biggest challenges I see is that it's very, very hard to have a very rare talent of someone who can 
understand all those 30 different data sets and understand at the highest level what a business or what their customer wants and then make all the connections in between. That those kind of unicorn or I don't know what you call them, people people who are have just a whole set of skills. And I, I've tried to hire them. They're very hard to they're very hard to hire. And what happens is you just start breaking up all the challenges and putting that data together and applying tools on it and getting insight to different roles. And then you end up mm-hmm. with a team. And um, if, you know, I, I, having done technology and managed teams, how do you get a team of people to work together? Um, and I, I, how do you get them to create? That's a very challenging problem. And I think as the field of data science and data engineering and the whole data field changes, it, it, to me, data ops is about focusing less on, hey, I got a, I got a new tool, but man, I've got a lot of people. How do we get them to work? Um, mm-hmm. And how do you operationally make this whole thing um, deliver value? Um, that's where I think data ops is, is, it's just part of what's happening in the field. And maybe it's also part of what happens when you get a little older, right? As you, as you grow up, you, you focus on, hey, I'm a really cool person. I can do my thing by myself. But then you start running into challenges with all the people you work with. And then your perspective changes and says, wow, I've got to get all these people I work with to be able to deliver to work with right. me. And I think that's, that's the, right. the situation that's happening in, in the analytics world. We're getting out of that uh, heroic age, the data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. And we're trying to yeah. think about, well, how do you really get value with a bunch of people who, um, you know, could, could uh, uh, you know, you've got random broken data. Well, people also randomly break things with the best intentions. And how do you make that yeah. all work? That's right. That's a really good point. Well, I'll tell you what, I think it's a decent segue to our next guest. We've got Mark Marinelli dialed in from Tamer, another very interesting company. It's a Michael Stonebreaker company. I've had Michael on several shows over the years. He is one of the godfathers of this whole data management space. Uh, And Tamer is doing some very interesting stuff around data unification, which is kind of what I was alluding to there. So, Mark, welcome to Inside Analysis. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me. Um, random, crappy data. I love it. I think that's the watchword for the day. Um, we're probably not going to put that in our marketing materials, but it's spot on to the problem it, that, that we're trying to solve, Tamer. It might it might be a song on the next Beck album. You never know. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, right, right. Some pretty esoteric stuff. Yeah, so th- let's talk a bit about um, this whole concept of data unification because kind of to the point I was trying to make earlier – you know, we had this whole era in data management um, that crystallized with enterprise data warehousing. And the whole plan was let's pull all the important data into one place and then be able to analyze it and slice it and dice and understand what's happening. And of course, what has happened over the last, I don't know, five to 10 years is the amount of data, the amount of sources for data, the amount of different kinds of data models and data types and so forth has just exploded to the point where old ways of doing things are just not feasible anymore. And so now we're seeing more and more companies like Tamer focus on ways to sort of virtually reconcile information systems and data. Can you tell us a bit about uh, what Tamer does and how you see the whole data ops space panning out? Yeah, sure. So I'll I'll contrast us to the way that people are trying to do this, even if let's presuppose that folks have got their their agile mindset together and they want to endeavor to take on projects in a non-waterfall way and and embrace some of the presets of data ops. um, They're still hiring a bunch of data engineers to do a lot of data engineering. They're building a lot of complex conditional logic to bring all of these data sets together to accommodate all of the variety that you see across sources and formats. Um, And it's still very, very expensive. It's still very resource intensive. It still drags data scientists down into data engineering when they actually want to spend their time doing interesting machine learning work and and AI. Um, They're still spending this received wisdom of of 70% of their time working in there because we're still doing something which has, has improved with, with things like data prep technologies and, and there, there's better tools, but we're still oftentimes just codifying business logic that is oftentimes poorly um, translated from the end users who most intimately are affected by the analytics mm-hmm. done on these data um, and, and require somebody to build and maintain. Um, that, that presents a big barrier. Where Tamer comes in is in the application of algorithmic machine learning approaches to automate in a lot of ways, just completely obviate 
a lot of that data engineering work by, by discovering hmm. uh, patterns and relationships among the data and then bringing in the end users who understand the data the best to weigh in on whether that ML is right or wrong and, and train it. And over time, we can build a system that, that accommodates a, a wide variety of data at scale where uh, we would have had to stand up traditionally a big MDM or ETL project, cost justify hmm. it, get a bunch of people involved and, and have a really hard long tail on that. Um, yeah, so that's where does that very... fit in with data ops? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, go ahead, finish where the point. Where does that fit in with data ops is it's, it's mechanizing. If you think of DevOps having um, certain totally essential technologies like automated regression testing, um, if you had all of your developers um, spending 60 or 70% of their time on that, you wouldn't be too happy about it. Similarly, in the application of, of technologies like ours, you can um, automate a ton of the time uh, away and have people focused on the, on the higher value work. That's interesting. You know, we did a show uh, just last week, in fact, with Donald Farmer and Stefan Groschup. Um, Donald, of course, is with TreeHive these days. He's an old uh, visionary in the in the data management space from Microsoft for years and years, and then over at Click. And uh, Stefan, of course, came from Datamir, and we were talking about how AI, machine learning, in particular artificial intelligence, really is starting to creep up all around some of the usual long-standing domains like business intelligence, for example. And now you just kind of referenced master data management. And it's very interesting to see how expertly applied machine learning can, in fact, and I love the word you used, obviate so many traditional painful processes. Now, I've got a fairly long history with master data management and man, back in the early days in like, let's call it the you know, early 2000s, if you were to have a successful master data management program, you needed a lot of really strict rules and procedures and people really had to follow those rules in order for the technology to work. And I think that's part of what we're seeing change these days is that with, again, well-designed, well-implemented machine learning technologies, you don't have to do all that heavy lifting anymore. And to me, that's a huge deal because a lot of these solutions, well, first of all, they came around because of holes in the system, let's put it mildly, uh, holes in the system of data management. And they were pretty heavy duty in terms of just the amount of software that was required, the amount of energy that goes into it, the amount of people that have to work on it. This is big, big stuff. So I think we'll, we'll pick this up after the break to get more into why that's such a big deal. But I think we're onto something here. And folks, stick around for a couple minutes. We'll be right back. You're listening to Inside Analysis. Every business wants to use the power of data, AI, and analytics for competitive advantage. Many solutions claim to help, but they restrict how and where you analyze data, even forcing you to stand up separate clusters for different types of data. The MapR data platform is the industry's best for AI and analytics because it lets you run any model against all your data with any tool. The result? Data scientists are more productive, faster with a MapR data platform. Deploy on-premises, in the cloud, or in hybrid clouds with mission-critical reliability and security needed to get into production. Get value from data, AI, and analytics faster, better, easier. MapR. What's the longest-running radio show in the world focused on data? DM Radio. Since 2008, we've interviewed hundreds of the brightest minds in the business world. Want to be a guest sometime? Send an email to info at dmradio.biz. That's info at dmradio.biz. Reltio's mission is to bring the power of self-learning to every business. The Reltio self-learning data platform, developed natively in the cloud, organizes enterprise data for continuous GDPR compliance. With Reltio, businesses can consolidate consumer profiles, consents, and interactions with complete data lineage, task management, and audit history for timely profile updates, deletion, and notifications. Reltio organizes data from all internal, external, social, and third-party sources and of all formats, creating a unified data set with unlimited personalized views for compliance, marketing, sales, 
sales, and data steward teams. With built-in machine learning, Reltio then recommends actions and finally measures and correlates business impact. This self-learning cycle empowers companies to put data at the heart of every decision, infuse analytics into operational processes, and continuously learn about customers, products, consents, and their relationships. Leading Global 2000 and companies of all sizes and industries rely on Reltio to become self learning we are truly at peak celebrity in this nation, with Kanye West going off the reservation last week, speaking up for free speech and free thought in a seriously unpopular manner, Kane the wrestler vying for the mayor in Tennessee, and Pamela Anderson at the center of one of the greatest intel data surveillance leaking disclosure scandals in human history. It's a weird time. But amidst all of that, a bit of sense came out of the left coast from Ye's wife, Kim Kardashian. I'll tell you why next on Dan's Life. Get your radio show or podcast distributed around the world. Find out more by emailing sales at gabradionetwork.com. That's sales at gabradionetwork.com. I'm taking back a lot of what I've said about Kim Kardashian. Yeah, I still think the family is nuts, manipulating, conniving, yet brilliant, distasteful businesswoman Chris for a mother, but I have to compliment Kim. Sometimes people in positions of influence can do good things, and that's what she did last week. She phoned the White House because she can, and Jared Kushner will listen. He is, of course, Trump's advisor and son-in-law. Kim let Jared know about an injustice that's been underway for a while. Alice Johnson is 62 years old and is in jail for life. What she did? Bad. But she didn't kill anybody. She didn't hold a bus full of middle schoolers hostage at gunpoint. She didn't rob a bank. She didn't fire any shots. She is in life for a drug charge. No weapons. I want to be clear. Alice Johnson did do wrong. She was part of a drug smuggling ring, and by all accounts, she took the fall while the others testified against her. But she had no priors. The mother five kids was struggling. To me, that's not worth dying in jail. Years, yes, but not life. So I'm crediting Kim Kardashian for using her connections. President Trump may pardon this woman who's already done those 22 years. Maybe she deserves more, but not life. Life is for taking life, for injuring others, for hurting kids, not for being another cog in the wheel of the most dangerous and failed enterprise of waging war on drugs that cannot be won. This is... Welcome back to Inside Analysis. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Take us to the future. All right, folks, we're looking to the future, trying to figure out how problems will be solved in the future to where we don't have to do all the boring, tedious stuff. Is a term I learned uh, on Friday, in fact. I'd never heard it before. I'm always excited to learn new terms. Narrow AI. That's right, narrow artificial intelligence, meaning very focused, not the uh, Skynet stuff that everyone's worried about with Elon Musk trying to get us all scared so we don't look at his cash flow problems. I'm just kidding, I don't know what's going on over there. But narrow AI, so we were just talking with Mark Marinelli of Tamer about how um, some of this machine learning stuff is really quite compelling because it can, again, allow us to circumvent some of the old and very complicated processes that we see in the data management space. So, Mark, just bring you back to talk about that. You were going to give us some information about how Tamer is allowing companies to kind of circumvent some of these old ways. Right? Yeah, and, it, and it's really allowing um, it, building AI and, and ML to go out and, and find all these relationships is one thing, but incorporating the feedback from the end users who know the data well enough to actually provide the training that ML needs, that's what's really important. Yeah, a bunch of data scientists may be potentially poorly translating um, guidance from those users into their models um, is, uh, is different from having a workflow that is intimately involving people um, who, who would never uh, say that, never call themselves a data scientist, maybe not even a data analyst, but they are a data expert and they can weigh in to help build these models, which can propagate that, that knowledge across uh, across the entire data landscape. But the, the trouble with all of this that we've seen is skepticism, that people are kind of used to a rules-based deterministic world where I go in and I codify a bunch of this conditional logic in my big MDM system, and it's, it's ironclad. It's always going to give me the same answer, um, to which the response would be, yeah, sure, this is probabilistic, but um, are you sure that all those rules are right? Are you sure that those rules are right right now? Because they might have been right yesterday, but some new data came in and, and obviated or vitiated some of those rules. 
you need something that's, that's more resilient, and that's where we see models and um, the, the direct uh, participation in, in honing those models from data experts is, is actually going to get you there um, a lot faster, better, cheaper than, than what you think is robust and foolproof now. Well, this is kind of interesting, too. In a second, we'll bring in our, our final guest. Uh, Jira's been waiting in the wings patiently out there. But what you're bringing to mind is something I've kind of sensed for a long time, which is that when you rely on people to manually codify rules and even manually codify what they're doing in their job every day, there's a pretty significant gray area, right? Not and It's not because people are... Um, inattentive or, or trying to obfuscate or anything along those lines, it's just hard to really know how you spend a lot of your time, especially if you're busy. And so I think this one of the trends that I see in the whole data management space is to automate a lot of these processes by, by watching human behavior and by watching and paying attention to what people do, which systems they access, for example. That's something we're really seeing take flight these days where dashboards will be dynamically populated for executives based upon their past behavior. What did you look at last week? What did you look at last year? These are some very interesting dynamics in the marketplace, and I think it's they are, they're straws in the wind for how the future is going to look. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. That That's really the next flavor of all of this is the suggestion to surface the right information to the right people in the context of how they're working. Um, and, and even more importantly, I would argue, is soliciting the feedback from those people who can say, well, th this is actually wrong, what you showed me here, and to be able to propagate that feedback uh, across the board so that we're, we're not only surfacing to people a very targeted and optimized workflow of how they're going to work with their data, but we have t thousands or tens of thousands of users directly contributing to the increasing quality of that data. And that, that's just all about having as light touch on people's day-to-day -day workflow, you know, meet them in the tools that they already use, and um, and give them as little to have to uh, think about before they can weigh in on on the veracity or, or quality of their data. Yeah, that that's really good stuff. And I, I think to me, it, it's kind of owing to this whole new trend that I'm referring to as real-world data. It's looking at what people are really doing, just tracking their use of information systems as opposed to again relying on someone to say, okay, I do this here, I do that there. I mean, documentation in and of itself for software development has always been a challenge, right? Because most developers, they don't want to document what they're doing. They just want to do it, right? Right. Absolutely. Hmm. Good point. Well, let's bring in our final guest. We have Jira Houston of Nexla waiting in the wings out there, dialing in from Mission Control. Jira, welcome to Inside Analysis. Tell us a bit about what you're doing and how you see the data ops space playing out. Hey, Eric, it's great to be here, you know, talking about this important topic. Thanks so much for, for having me on. I um, really enjoyed the conversation with the other panelists. And, uh, you know, I'm here at Nexla, um, and we're at a scalable data operations platform. So we're really in the trench trenches of this whole data ops movement, working with a lot of innovative companies that are really embracing it, taking it head on. And what we find is that one of the main motivators for embracing a data ops approach or philosophy or even data ops tooling is the proliferation of intercompany data collaboration. So we've talked a lot about analytics and machine learning, which is super important. And we certainly see in, in our markets that more and more companies are starting to dip their toes in the waters of ML and AI. And in order to do that, they need more and more data. Um, but increasingly, we're also seeing that more and more companies are ingesting data from their trading partners. So if you think about it, every company has to ingest data from a third party, right? Whether that's a SaaS, cloud SaaS uh, solutions provider, like their CRM or their marketing partners, or even their trading partners, their suppliers, you know, their um, the, the folks that get, bring them the inventory, or in the case of retailers, the vendors. So how do you manage integrating all of these different data sources. And I think that's one area where data ops has really started to shine and we're seeing a lot more discussion about it in the marketplace because if you have to integrate with hundreds, in some cases even thousands of data partners, how do you do that in a scalable, repeatable way? 
if that's really what's powering your business in terms of being able to bring other products to market or expand your offerings, how can you do that in a timely fashion? And I think data ops is really the way that it has to be because there just simply aren't enough, and we talk a lot about this, uh, what we might call data engineers or backend engineers and able to do the manual work of integrating, doing the ETL job, building the data pipelines, cleaning up the data in order to make the data move to really power business. And so at Nexo, we really think about data operations as, um, as the function that controls the flow of data from source to value. So think about all of those jobs that have to happen in between when you connect to a data source, doing all the transformations, doing all the monitoring, checking data quality, building your data catalog until where it can be dumped into where it's going to add business value, whether that's into an analytics model or whether that's frankly into the actual product that someone is building. Um, so data ops is a way to think about really making that flow and make it automated and as painless as possible. Yeah, that's really good stuff. You guys, I think, took a very clever approach to enabling the information economy. I'm looking at your site right now and you've got, for example, API to Snowflake, which is one of these new cloud-based data warehousing companies. Redshift, of course, is Amazon. And you can do FTP. Basically, you are trying to serve as the marshalling area for moving large amounts of data from one place to another, right? Yeah, that's right. And we, and we are seeing it happening in every industry. Uh, one thing Nexo does is every year we, we do a data ops survey. Uh, we survey the market. Last year we surveyed about 300 data professionals. We're just in the midst of building our second annual survey right now. And what we're finding is that more and more companies are starting to integrate with different data sources. So close to 80 companies have reported that they're ingesting data from third party sources. For a lot of different reasons, as I mentioned, but when this when when you know this happens, the complexity is just multiplied, right? You think about um, your ability to integrate with third party sources or even internal sources. You never get the data in the format that you want. Um, you always have to perform some transformations. You need to be confident in the data quality. And finally, you need to write that data to where it ultimately needs to get to. Um, and that's why it's so important to be able to connect to, you know, any data source, whether that's APIs or FTP servers, because, you know, despite the proliferation of real-time data streaming, a lot of business data is moved around in CSVs uploaded onto FTP servers. So how do you connect to that and how do you make it a scalable and repeatable process to move your business forward? That's really the challenge and that's what Nexla was founded to solve. Yeah, that's very interesting because there are so many ways to skin the cat. I mean, I think that's like the blessing and the curse of the technology space and certainly with software and software development, right? There's, there are so many different ways that you can get something done. And, of course, the big challenge with software development is that the environment keeps changing, right? The form factor keeps changing. We were talking before the show about going from PC to Mac and then back over to PC. And, you know, frankly, I was just having some problems on a Mac, and I think it's a result of a dragon speak, which does not work very well on a Mac. And I think it also messes up other stuff that happens in that environment. And this is something a lot of people don't, realize, right, even you'll find this in, in large enterprise IT environments, you introduce new technologies, they can actually negatively impact other stuff that you have already running, which of course is one of the main reasons why operations people don't want new stuff, right, if they don't want to tinker with things, you want to be careful about that. But I think you've taken a very interesting approach, just owing to the fact that, as you suggest, people are still going to be loading large amounts of data in flat files and CSV files and so forth. And what you're trying to trying to do is provide this marshalling area that allows almost like a, a, a metro train station for, for data moving around. Is that kind of the vision? Yeah, exactly. Because you can't control how you're gonna get the data that you need. You know, I think it's a it's it's a rude awakening for a lot of companies where they're going to be receiving data, whether it's for machine learning or artificial intelligence from IoT, you know, traditional web, web click data or other trading partner business data. You can't control how that data comes to you. You might like it to be in a really well-designed API that, you know, the partner always calls you three weeks in advance before they issue a new version update, right? But that doesn't happen in reality. So what we found is that we really need tools that can handle all of that for us. 
you know, when we talk to data, data professionals, we find that, you know, 70% of them want to spend more time working on different ways of, and solutions to work with their data. They don't want to be working on just building the pipeline or troubleshooting. How do we take some of that work off of their plate, right? This is the traditional trope where data scientists are spending too much of their time on how to get the data instead of actually driving value from it. How do we automate that with the tooling, with machine learning, so that you can be alerted before there's a problem, right? Is the rate of change of your data changing? Wouldn't I like to know that before it triggers um, disaster in some downstream process? So as we increase the number of data sources we have to connect to for all of the business objectives and for the machine learning and insights that we want to drive, how do we automate that? And how do we put it in the hands of more folks? So in some of our, for some of our customers, it's not a data engineer who's touching the product. It's someone who manages a data catalog, who manages the relationship with the trading partner. They're the data expert. They know everything about that data, but they don't code. How do you empower them to build a data pipeline so that the business can get done? That's really one of the, the key opportunities that we see in the market now. Um, when you put the data in the hands of the folks who know how to use it, businesses can grow faster. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's uh, it's a good point that you're making here, and you know, I'm seeing again more and more companies carve out these interesting little niches in the information landscape. And uh, I guess I'm curious to know, from a development perspective, then what, where do you guys focus your attention? Is it is it trying to track industry trends, for example, data warehousing, cloud-based data warehousing, right? Because if you're going to succeed in, in doing enterprise software or even any kind of you know, heavy-duty consumer software or just general business software, you need to have your niche that you're focused on. So what's, what's the niche that's driving your, your attention right now that's driving your development? Yeah, so what we see is really people want a solution that can connect to whatever their partners are throwing at them, right? So, you know, you take the case of, of one of our customers that I can talk about is Instacart, the grocery delivery service. Um, and think about who they have to integrate with. They have to integrate with hundreds of, of grocery partners all over the country. And all of those partners have a different way of sending them data. It could be flat files. It could be APIs. Um, in rare cases, they might be able to connect to some other database. So there are a lot of different platforms that you need to be able to connect to. And how can you build technology that's versatile enough, that's not brittle, that won't break if you point it to a new source? So that's really the key. And while I think, you know, traditionally folks have been very targeted on we support these three different platforms, that's going to be our bread and butter. I don't think that's going to fly in today's marketplace. That's a good point. And there is so much data flying around these days. I mean, that's the amazing thing about the information economy. It's why we have a whole show focused on it, right? It's because you were talking about data at a scale that has never existed before. And consequently, you have all the old ways of doing data management just frankly breaking down. Um, and we're going to go through what I think is going to be a fairly turbulent but interesting period of time over the next five to seven years or so as companies that are embracing this new tidal wave of data come up with ways of dealing with it. And uh, you're probably going to be seeing whole separate teams built around these new technologies to manage those processes. They're going to have to reconcile with the old ways of doing things, right? So, That's okay, right. folks, we'll be, we'll be right back after a short break. You're listening to Inside Analysis. Stick around. Enforceable starting May 25th, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, applies to any organization worldwide that collects or processes personal data for EU residents. Gartner says by the end of 2018, over 50 companies will not be compliant with GDPR. MapR and Talent can help. Download their 16-step plan for creating a governed data lake capable of meeting even the most stringent data protection, storage, portability, and security requirements. Visit Talent.com to get your free white paper today. A great radio show may sound like it's easy to make, but if you've ever tried, you know that's not the case. With the time spent engineering, producing, and archiving, you end up losing focus on what really matters, the content of your show. If you put your show on the Gab Radio Network, you'll be able to leave all those technical worries to our staff of highly trained engineers and producers. And all you need to do is have fun and put on a great show. Want to find out more? Send an email over to sales at gabradionetwork.com. That's sales at gabradionetwork.com. Do you have a great idea for a radio show but have no idea where to start? Or have you been hosting a podcast for a while and want to take it to the next level? 
If so, you need the Gab Radio Network. To host a show on the Gab Radio Network, all you need is your voice, and we'll handle the rest. From technical engineering to full-service audio production and much more. Every show on the Gab Radio Network can be heard on our station on the TuneIn Radio app. Plus, we put all our shows on our satellite, which is accessed by 5,500 stations. And here's the best part. You can host from anywhere you want. There are many means to connect to the Gab Radio Network remotely, and our staff of highly trained engineers and producers will make you sound like you're right here in studio. So, if you want to be on the Gab Radio Network, the same network that hosts the Small Business Advocate, Radio MD, and Talkin' Pets, send an email right now to sales at gabradionetwork.com. That's sales at gabradionetwork.com. If you run a large corporation, small business, or anything in between, you need ads to help get the word out. A full page in the newspaper sounds good. A TV spot sounds even better. But let's face it, newspapers are essentially last-minute wrapping paper, and a TV spot is just expensive and basically code for bathroom break. Talk radio is different. Commercials cost practically nothing to produce, and the listeners are loyal. They like what they like, and they stay tuned in. When they hear about a new product or service during their favorite show, they can't wait to try it out for themselves so they can talk about it with their friends. And you know how radio listeners like to talk. If you want to add radio to your marketing portfolio, you need the Gab Radio Network. Gab Radio is the team of full-service experts you've been looking for, from writing to production, distribution, voiceover, and more. We make sure your spots are paired with the right shows in the right markets at the right time of day so the right people can hear. Since we're in over 100 markets across 34 states, Canada, and American Samoa, I'd say it's a pretty good place to start. If you want to know more, just email sales at gabradionetwork.com. That's sales at gabradionetwork.com. Welcome back to Inside Analysis. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, folks, back here trying to understand the future of business. Uh, I was just making some of my predictions. I'll give a plug to our new show. We've got a show called Real World Data, launching in just a couple of weeks with SAP, actually the SAP Data Network. And it's got me really thinking about this whole reality of real world data. We were just talking in the break there with our guests about how much things are changing. And these are not minor evolutionary changes. These really are major tectonic revolutionary changes in how things get done. And it's going to take a while. I think uh, you're just going to see a lot of older systems just wound down or turned off or broken up and recrafted into different cloud deployments. But uh, things are absolutely changing, and the speed of change seems to me to be increasing. Uh, so with that, let's bring Chris Berg back from Data Kitchen. We'll then hear from Mark Marinelli again of Tamer and Jerry Houston of Nexla. But Chris, I look at this data ops space, and I really see something very cool that's happening, which is a, a sort of calibrating and certifying of data management practices and data lifecycle management. And if done correctly, if done efficiently, it's going to enable what we might call the whole next generation of analytics. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think there's, a, there's just a lot of data out there, right? And people over the last decade or 15 years have gone from seeing it from exhaust to value. And there's new sources of data, whether it's, you know, satellites or real-time video. And so the synthesis of all these data sets actually give an opportunity for businesses to become a truly data-driven organization. And even if you take that a little farther, a sort of uh, model-driven, AI-driven, real-time organization, much like you wouldn't expect when, you, when we go to Amazon now, if you went to the Amazon website 10 or 15 years ago, it would look the same for you as it does for me. Now it's completely crafted to what you've done before. Or if you go to Spotify, it's completely crafted to what you've done before based on all the sets of data that you've seen. And so we've seen uh, companies are realizing that uh, consumers are better when they have a crafted experience. And I think it's going to be the same thing for people in internal companies. They're going to want to have analytics crafted to what they've done and analytics crafted to what that they've they've uh, they've seen. And so when, how do you do that? How do you get a cycle time to deliver this kind of innovative, personalized, crafted, real-time, real-world data uh, and just not kill your team, not have shipment times of every three months, and how to actually make sure that the data is right when, you know, you've got 
one part of the uh, situation, you're trying to run a factory much like Toyota delivers cars of high quality and low errors. But on the other hand, you're just trying to innovate and, and, and put new stuff in front of people to see how they react and, and then even track their reaction to see if they're, they're improving upon it. And so you've got these two diametrically opposite things going on. One is a, a high quality production line, and then you've got, I want to change things all the time. And so it ends up with a very creative, dynamic world. And I think at the end, those ideas that came out of manufacturing, those ideas that came out of software development and DevOps are really the the, the main drivers of becoming a, a fast analytic organization. And I think that's that's what we're going to we're going to see over the next 10 years. Hmm. Yeah, I'd have to agree. And uh, Mark, I'll bring you back in to kind of comment on this. You know, old habits really do die hard do you think that we're going to need to see just a new cadre of people come in with new roles and new assignments and new teams and new approaches or do you think that uh, yesterday's information workers really can bone up and and hone their chops if you will to handle this new world oh i think it's very much the latter um I think that the people's new people's expectations of how they will interact with the data are going to be differently calibrated from people who've been working in you know traditional tool sets. But I think let's put it on ourselves as technologists to surface to the traditional user the very small amount of feedback that we need from them about the quality of the data or something and not put it on them to learn our arcane tool sets or, or do any of the sort of you know programming or role stuff that they've had to do in the past. I mean, I think Chris said something about the consumerization of, um, of data management, I'll, I'll say, is I mean, if I walk into a restaurant, Google knows that I'm in a restaurant and it asks me if they have parking and do they have takeout. It should be that way when I'm sitting in a Tableau dashboard. Um, I should just get a quick pop-up, unintrusive, that says, is this actually right? You know, you, you just changed these numbers mm -hmm. three times. Um, is that right, or should I tell wow. somebody to go look at that? And I say yes or no, and I'm done. Um, that's where there's a whole wow. bunch of plumbing in the back end that can enable that to happen um, and without making people change the way that they do their work. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting point you just raised there. And you are talking about a, a whole new caliber of information architecture to be able to support that, right? Because to your point, if you're looking at a dashboard, you, you want to have for data governance purposes, drill down capability and lineage capability to understand where did this information come from? And that's, you know, in and of itself, it's going to be a bit of a uh, difficult pill to swallow because there are a lot of people who just fill in numbers as needed, right? And don't, don't pay too much attention to that. But man, in the new world where it's all connected, that's going to be really, really hard. Right, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. We, we just have to set the, the bar, the skill bar very, very low so we can have as many eyes on the problem as, as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Jarrah, I'll bring you back in um, because, again, you guys have such an interesting approach to enabling information exchange and information management across ecosystems, right? That's what you guys are doing that I find quite compelling. And are, are you finding that a lot of the use cases you're fueling are net new opportunities, or are you actually seeing some larger organizations start to try to offload how they used to do things to do things new ways? It's definitely both, but I think everything is driven by the desire for the business to grow faster, to keep up with the speed of technology and the speed of the data and all of the opportunities that are presented. I mean, think about all of the data that a company has access to today and all of the cool analysis and models that they can build to move their business forward. Well, none of that pie in the sky, you know, happy place is possible without all the grunt work behind it. And I think that the proliferation of data is going to be solved by humans and machines. The machines have to be the one that, that connect, that make it flow, that you brought up a really great point, Eric, is the lineage of tracking the lineage. How do you know where anything came from? How do you know if you trusted it, the confidence, if you need to troubleshoot? We have to track the lineage of how data is moving across. And the machines have to be the ones to do that in an automated fashion. Otherwise, there just aren't going to be enough engineers on the planet to keep up with all the data integration and data management that has to happen to enable this business growth. 
But you have to have the humans and you have to be able to empower them to use this data. And, you know, I couldn't agree with Mark more that we need to get as many as people, as many people as possible looking at this problem. It's too big for only the technologists to handle alone, the business folks, the account managers, the folks who are managing the business relationships also be, need to be able to move that data, understand it, monitor it, cor correct it when something goes wrong in order to recognize all of that business opportunity. Yeah, and you know, I think you've actually given me another idea for a show sometime in the future on information superhighways, right? If you think about the evolution of the highway system just here in the United States, well, we had all of these old two-lane highways from way back in the day, from let's say 100 years ago or so. Uh, and now, of course, we have the interstate highway systems, which were really in the 1950s when most of those came out. And now, of course, some of the newer ones are even more uh, robust than that to handle all this traffic. And, and that's really what we need in the information management world, right? It's because we had the old pipes and the old data sets and the old ways of doing things. But there's so much more information flying around now. And if you can get trusted resources to serve as the brokers and the marshalling areas for large amounts of data that many people are going to use, stuff like Twitter data, Facebook data. We, of course, had this whole fiasco with Facebook just testifying before Congress just the other day. It seems to me that's a nice place to implement some governance and some standards and, by the way, maybe stop some some uh, maleficent actors who are doing bad things. What do you think about that, Jira? Absolutely. Think about it. You know, computer science is being taught in high schools. For some school districts, that's part of the core curriculum. If you think that data management or being able to work with data is going to be the purview of an elite class of folks, you know, you're going to be sorely mistaken. More and more people need to touch this data. We need to have those controls that are built into the processes and the tools so that we can prevent these bad actors. I mean, Gartner talks a lot about the citizen data scientist, the citizen data integrator. I mean, I think even that's going to become an antiquated term because it's going to be as fundamental as being able to send an email, being able to access, send, transform, and analyze data. I mean, these are this is a skill set that's going to enable people to function in the next 20 or 30 years. And it's up to us as technologists to create the tools that let that happen with, with you know, a minimum amount of bad actors and negative consequences. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Closing thoughts, uh, 20 seconds each, I suppose, Chris Berg. You know, I think it's, it, it's, to me, it's not, it's about a sign that the industry is maturing, that we're actually are talking about bad actors and, and the power we're getting out of the gee whiz phase of data analytics into looking at how do we make it really productive? How do we make it really secure? And given that all the people are working on it, we've got the, the dual edge of like, you've got a team of people creating analytics. And then on the other side, what about the people who are, are understanding analytics, the culture of being uh, data driven? And I think all these things are just a sign of a, an industry that's growing and probably will continue to grow for the next 10 or 20 years. So we're not, we're not done yet. In some ways, we're, we're just beginning. Hmm. Okay, folks, we've burned through an entire hour of content here. Once again, big thanks to all of our guests today. We heard from Jira Houston of Nexla, Mark Marinelli of Tamer, and Chris Berg of Data Kitchen. These are all very interesting companies, folks. I encourage you to hop online and look them up because they really are forging the future of information management. And let's face it, that's the foundation of the information economy. It's a wonderful time to be in the business, folks. With that, we're going to bid you farewell. You've been listening to Inside Analysis. Bye-bye.